Hold a lit cigarette before your eyes and think of the times that you have smoked and can really remember. Remember then what was happening with it, how you lit it. You smoked it where? Was your collar turned against the wind and your hand cupping a lighted match and you felt handsome? Were you in a cell in the dark on a bunk, listening to the padded feet of screws, legs dangling and rolling dank butts, and you felt depraved? Were you in a before bed of love with bare limbs entwined like the air and smoke in your murmuring throat? Or were you working with hands that chiselled and fine worked the sculptured land of our earth? and into your eye, from your squeezed corner mouth, drifted dribbles of smoke that hurt. Good evening and welcome to the Rochester Castle, and in particular, welcome to Shelton Lee at the Rochester Castle. Shelton chose the Rochester because of its legendary status as one of the initial and great reading venues for poetry in Melbourne. We honour his wish by launching here. I would like to introduce Dorothy Porter, who is going to launch. Shelton's book, Nebuchadnezzar. It's more than an honour to be launching Shelton Lee's fiery and enchanting and ballsy and heart-achingly humane book, Nebuchadnezzar. It is a gift, a gift to me. It's a deep pleasure to be launching this book. Arthur Boyd's cover painting, Nebuchadnezzar Burning, is a fabulous painting an unforgettable image and a fucking hard act to follow. <laughs> Especially the painting's burning, gobsmacking testicles. You can go and have a look for yourselves. Reminding me of how few Australian books of poetry, whether written by men or women, have balls. Even shriveled white balls, let alone red hot coals balls. Again, have a look at the cover. But like Boyd's burning Babylonian king, Shelley, too, is on fire in this book. And this is a book with balls, red-hot ones, Shelley, <laughs> with a rhythm and swagger of sweet anger. Shelley tilts at all the serious windmills, sex, love, art and death. But also the book thrums with a gallantly old-fashioned political heart. The poems stroll the streets of Fitzroy and Clifton Hill in Melbourne or Redfern in Sydney, Shelley's haunts. But the people and landscapes of the poems haven't been gentrified. Like uh, from the poem 1988, the parky darkies round their campfires in the dreaming of Redfern. Or in the poem Fitzroy, the streets full of children sucking lollies next to old men with no tomorrows who rock on broken chairs and stare at a bitumen sea. After reading these passionately empathic poems of Shelton's, I felt a kind of shame. I felt as if I've been walking these same streets and neighbourhoods with my head up my safe middle-class bum. Like all good poets, Shelton Lee has ripped off my eyelids. But there is also the private Shelley coming through these lovely and lyrically intimate poems. The Shelley who can write so movingly of very different men like Adrian Rawlings and Barry Reed. I'd like to now read Shelley's spot on and wonderfully sad and droll elegy for Adrian, who I also knew well. Radiant awnings. That's the one. Radiant awnings for Adrian Rawlings. 10-11-2001. I wish Adrian was here to hear this. <laughs> I think he is. 
I still can't comprehend the 3,000 people who perished in New York a day before Adrian died. Yet I can recall at least 3,000 people whose lives were affected by Adrian Rawlings, at least one. From Hernando's in Armidale in the breezy early 60s, when the golden leaves of autumn schooled along the high street, Jazz Centre 44, mad turret of music opposite the leery grin of Luna Park, Black Allen, Mariwala, if you're white, it's all right. If you're brown, stick around. But if you're black, then brother, get back, get back, get back. Jazz music muting soft sounds of the sea, while Adrian read a set with cedar green, first time I heard poetry with jazz, the black pussycat and Alby with his LSD and Tat's hotel full of desperates, libertarians, lovers who free fell into the 70s, anarchists and Adrian. Frank Trainers down the lane where Glenn Tomasetti crooned folk and Judy Jacques ululated her strange jazz and Adrian. We'd stand on the bridge and look at the sad Yarra and here's my favourite line, more gropers on the banks than in the water. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to pinch it, Shelton. <laughs> Flinders Street Station loomed on the unlit side like a sphinx. The soft shoe shuffle of the square dance called from beneath the fairy lights of the Trocadero had just disappeared, and the fairies were tacked to bed beneath the Princess Bridge. Adrian and I staggered there recently and marvelled at the change of our beloved river. Then came the 70s with his Yorimba smile, north of Gosford for the first of the festivals, where he out-thringed thring. And <laughs> Not easy. And I supplied the dope that was smoked openly for the first time in Australia, as reported by the BBC. <laughs> After this life, his life was a constant confest, <laughs> launching pad, Wallachia, my ponga, muwala, booze-ridden Sunbury, its heart hijacked, stalled. Tannel corn where he was always there, for, t sorry, tame lawn where he was always there for others with Mihog Baba at his side and live now as his credo, his belief that art resides in the heart, as strong at the end as it was at the start. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I don't know where the idea came from, to call it a wake, it was a, a book launch. Mm. Um, not many people launch a book on their deathbed either. He, he sort of took it in his stride. He, 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 um, he died very bravely, mm -hmm. you know, from what I saw. And that Nebuchadnezzar poem was very important to him. You know, it was um, it sort of pulled together all the imagery of Gertrude Street and all his sort of you know, you know stuff of, you know from the Australian painting from the boards and all that you know, all that imagery. It sort of uh, it was a really iconic poem to him, and the, and the collection was, you know, uh, very important to him. This was a photograph that was brought to me on the 9th of the 3rd of this month, oh, this be yeah, the 9th of the 3rd, right? Uh, the reason I'm going for the date on this is several reasons are important. This, this photograph was sent to me on the 9th of the 15th of 2005. Now, that is, I think, and by ruminating that last night with a couple of black fellas I had here and a couple of white dudes that remember them, this is the 1969 Kurite Aboriginal Fitzroy Stars, right? Now that was the Aboriginal football team that, that played in competition and all that sort of stuff. It was, was always getting busted for, um, for wild brawls and stuff, but you know, that was just something. And on the back of it, and, and it has photographs of, of, of Sonny and parts of Doug Nichols and, and Jock Austin. And most of these guys in here, most of the guys in here, I went to either a former school or jail with. That's where I first met him. That's why he sent me this one. The one. And then on the back, he's written to Sheldon Lee, lifetime friend of Sonny Booth's, Jock Austin, Bruce McGinnis, 
Lionel Rose and from all of our communities in this state and from all the other street kids, knockabouts and everyday people, you are a true friend and you'll always be in the thoughts of this eagle, which is his totem. Sonny, the 300th the general. Isn't it? That to me it was the equivalent of getting the Australia Award. His handwriting on the back is just fantastic. It's like a, it's like the black fellows are saying, "Welcome to the country, Shelley." You know, there you go. How all this relates into Nebuchadnezzar is that for years on and off that I've lived at Heidi and at Green Hills before that, I lived at Green Hills. Was this painter called a fire and falling Nebuchadnezzar, a fire and falling? Um, and now I discovered that there was a sequence of paintings and it was vaguely biblical to me at first, you know, which it turned out to be, of course, I, having read the, kid as, the, the book as a kid. Um, and I began to see these weird sort of parallels because, you know, when this started, Sally was still on the street, you know, still top heavy on the street and all that sort of stuff, looking after things and looking after the Blackfellas affair. And the more I looked at this bloody painting, the, the last one at, at, in, the, in the library at, at Heidi, which was the fire of falling, it all suddenly just clicked into space because I, I'd read Boag, who's a bloke that's done the research on the texts of Nebuchadnezzar and its relationship to the paintings, he told me how many paintings I had and each, each of the paintings were effectively as a right storyteller, a story unto themselves. So it's sunny when he says, I am Nebuchadnezzar. My balls are caught tight with white wire. I am caught in extremis, falling, paying the price for the poor. My body pays with fire. But I am Nebuchadnezzar. I am the king of Fitzroy. The cloud scud and the subtle landscape of trees emanate from me, for I am the king of what's loud. I am Nebuchadnezzar, and I am the king of Fitzroy. My skin is black, my heart is strong. You see my gardens there in Gertrude Street, beneath the high-rise flats? That's my Babylon. This land that long I've fought for, on behalf of all my tribe, for this is my country, and I am its king whose balls are caught taut with white wire, who sees blind on a starry night my gardens whose peaks is kept by police from the city of Tyre. The, the poem would have started the first time I saw one of those paintings, which was 15, 20 years ago. The actual poem would have started, and it's been through various forms and stages and shapes. I've got it all written down, all the changes have all gone to the executive, it all, there's, you know, there's a box full of changes just to that poem. Uh, we kept every scrap of it too. Uh, so, it, you know, it, it, it's an interesting process and, and the, the process of that particular poem was fascinating to me that I knew that poems could hang around for a long time and be sparked later up, but I didn't think that long you know, 15 years of it going on in the back brain all the time and I'd suddenly be, I don't know, I'd, I'd, I'd be in Darwin or something and something would remind me of, of Fitzroy which would remind me of Gozola and I'd ah, and there's Sonny, you know, and it's, the, the, the connections became invidious almost. So I, to get it out of my head, to get the whole story out of my head, I had to write it. And so that's what, that's what took the 14, 15 years of doing, was actually writing the poem in the back brain. I think he felt that he had some pretty valuable things to say, you know, about Australia per se and about Aboriginals and all that aspect of Australia. I think he felt he had some fairly important poems there um, that he'd managed to you know, birth or whatever that had just come out of the ether. And I think when you look at some of those poems, they are fairly important poems. 
the shame of it is they're probably not being studied at schools, and I reckon they should be, because they're pretty important, some of the poems that came out. There are many pantheons. Everyone's got a different take on that. If you're going to look at what, say, the Australian literary pages think of as the pantheon, he's probably not going to be there. But if you look at Melbourne, the Melbourne Live Poetry Pantheon, he's up there. He, he probably is Zeus. You know, he's, he was a very natural figurehead and um, very instrumental in encouraging a lot of poets. Well then, do you see that sky out there, he said? That's my blanket, understand? And those clouds, well, they're a pillar for me weary head. And those leaves spread all out across the ground, a soft cushion for where me torso's bound. <laughs> Just give me a gun and a couple of friendly types to talk with and I'll spend the afternoons away. The cities, <laughs> you ask me of the cities, well, the cities are like deserts, dry illusions of my mind. I stumble into mirages, brief pockets of delay deep beneath the bushes clutching methomegadeth in one hand and a cigarette in t'other, whispering for the ministrations of the devil on me mother. It was very much about being free. You know, I'd have to get that line. Uh, I think it's Confessions of a Metho Head. It's in that poem. There's that line which basically is saying, you know, you don't have to be in jail to do time of the soul or something like that. In other words, you could be a totally miserable, constrained... Um, miserable person, you know, you're doing time, you're doing time with your life because you're so miserable and unhappy. Yeah. So you didn't have to be in jail to be like that, you know, that was the point he was trying to make, I think. So I got thrown out into Toronto. Best thing that happened in my life. <laughs> what a journey that started off. And I, I had to survive, I had to to steal, to stay alive, but, you know, I, I knew all the milkman's roots in, in, in Paran and, and Turek and everywhere, so I had no shortage of milk and a little bit of cash if I needed, you know, 10 shillings, 10 bob for that day, I'd go and raid, you know, five different houses of their milk money, I'd, I'd come up with me 10 bob for the day, that's what I needed, wasn't greedy, it wasn't a matter of profit, it was a matter of survival. So. The true beginning of my life was, was really the day that I walked out of the Lee household in Turak. Before that, a lot of misery and a lot of... just a lot of misery. So it's it most things to me to lead, lead back to, to Tehran, you know, that's where, my, that's where my real life started. No, the rest of it was simply pres you know, preparation. How long were you there? Oh, well, I was remade the ward of the state very quickly, um, which meant that the government owed me until I was 18, which allowed them to lock me up without question when I was 16 in Pentridge in an adult jail because they, they could do it then because they, they, they had absolutely no laws pertaining to, to children that were the end result of adoption failures or whatever or uncontrollable kids they just under the beautiful brief sobriquet of ward of the state they could do anything they could have sent you to the bloody moon and no one would have known you know um, so you know they didn't actually have me for a particularly long time because I you know one bloke Stevie Stovell and I he was in for murdering a bloke at Hastings for 12 shillings when he was about 10 by the time I met him, he was 14, he'd already done four years in the place. And we made several spectacular breakouts. Um, the last one of which I just didn't get caught again from. I was, next time I was pinched, I was pinched, I was thrown straight into Pendridge. And in the cells in Goulburn, on mattresses, thin as two tallyos, it was cold. So damn cold there was ice, paperback thick, shining on the walls and wet as old nappies. And cold, brother, so, so cold. 
and second only to that a boy's home in Ballarat. I was 13 or 14 or somewhere near and these cheerful young buggers who got nowhere to go and no one to go with, unkillable their infant joy, their poor clothes hand-me-downs from a dream place just over Oliver's Hill. Some are now dead, but others rejoice in their orphanhood. So come, let us gather we orphans and three. Let's rejoice, let's rejoice in our urgency. Uh, you're one of the few people that um, I knew who could, um, who could talk to people from all walks of life in, in practically as natural a way as you could ever see. So, you know, you can rock into a tough bar, you could talk to anyone in that bar, anyone on the street. Um, any of the Aboriginal mob that he'd come across, um, right through to people um, you know, you find in the swank galleries. It didn't make any difference. He was quite at ease with people. And I guess a lot of that was um, the years on the streets. Um, having to get by, you know. And he used to talk about jail as being, that taught him a lot about people because it, he said it was like, like a pot boiler. You had, what well, men, you know, locked up in a small space. You had to learn to read people pretty well to survive, you know, and you had to learn to talk to survive too. And I think that's how Chilton survived in reform school and, uh, and jails was being able to talk, being able to communicate with people. We could talk them out of the like, development they were planning, I think. You know. In the last, you know, ten years or so, Sh Shelley sort of really uh, found, sort of found, uh, found himself, but found, found, found a place for himself more because he's always had himself. He always had, you know, I couldn't say found himself, but there was no room for him uh, before that. Really, you know, he was always marginalised you know, by a whole lot of reasons, you know. Or choice, you know, like all of us, like um, sort of come from that sort of tribe of you know outsider sort of uh, bohemian sort of lunatic fringe sort of the push sort of gang. Uh, but once it, when he when he started having his shops and um, you know. Like he was amazing, like he was able to, an ex-prisoner, he was able to walk into prison like a priest. You know, like, he was a poet and like he really, really clung to that and, and, sort of, and made something of it. I trust not in associates' truths, with on these truths I dwell in is but a darkened cell. The size of a cell being nine by fourteen, rotten old boards or something to play, I'm losing it now. It goes on for about 34 verses, and I wrote it when I was 12, and it came totally unencumbered. And I'm sitting in reform school. The only light I had was the, the outside security lights, you know, leading through, the, peeling through the windows, really. And I just sat there and just fucking wrote this thing. It was, a, um, I didn't know much about jail by then. I mean, I'd just gone into the system, but I, I could understand immediately the agony of it, and the, you know, the thing, throwing kids into boys' homes like that is really fucking outrageous, man. Um, yeah, so that's what that comes to. So I had, yes, I have written one that has come completely uh, without any changes made. Some people will probably say that I should make changes to it. Well, I would if I was concerned about it. Well, one site, one set for Warm by Legends of My Youth um, fell from my adumbrated lips. <laughs> I'm a 12 year old. I'm like, I'm a terror crack and terror eye. <laughs> I don't know where the hell I'm going. I don't know what life is anymore. You know, it, it has our, it literally becomes how I make every day. This is, is, is the puzzle for my every day, is how I make it, is what I make of it. And I still hold to that, you know. And so I basically only have good days. <laughs> One of the things about Shelton that I remember is 
is his generosity of spirit. Um, he was full of bullshit. One of, our, one of his closest friends, we used to joke, she used to call him nine-tenths fiction. But with that, there was a generosity of spirit about him that you forgave that, that bullshit. And you almost uh, enjoyed it. As you say, the story about the broken leg, I was going to say, <laughs> he was probably drunk. But that's not a good story. So he would make a better story out. And that was the poet in him. He was, uh, you know, and we all do that. Artists are liars after the emotional truth. Because the facts are not, the facts are not, don't convey the truth. Yeah, there's so much about that Heidi time and it's the 60s. How did you end up at Heidi? When did you first go there? Well, that was, that was quite interesting actually. Uh, like everything else in life, totally accidental. Um, I'd been kicked out of Sydney in 1966 for uh, selling LSD and manufacturing LSD. And they thought I had some hashish turning me up at the same time as they busted me, so they thought they had me for a certainty. Well, some instinct had told me to, because the LSD still wasn't against the law. There was no statute against it yet. And I put off the hash delivery for a couple of days. And they had an inside man, a small organisation, who for reasons of his own had decided to become a drop pick. And he sent the Jacks all this information and stuff. So they got me on the wrong day. So they got me when I only had LSD. And there was flight across Woolloomooloo, guns going off, fucking police dogs, Yahoo, Blahoo, I'm on the flea, you know, I could move real fast when I had two good legs there. Hard man to catch. <laughs> I eventually was pulled down that one. All I could do was fine us a, a hundred pounds or um, pounds or 50 days or 100 pounds or 20 days or something. But anyway, um, we just bailed ourselves out, you know, 100 quid was nothing. We had access to all that. And as we're getting bailed out, Abbott, who was the head of the drug squad at the time, has come up to me sideways, shuffled like cops do. They want to, you know, talk straight to you. They'll always be standing beside you, not looking at your eye. Um, He's come over and he's not looking at me either, but he's telling me I can straight his hand. I would move town if I were you to tell them. You won't, your shadow won't be able to piss. I think he said your shadow won't be able to piss without us knowing about it. So I said, oh, you know, you better give me a couple of days to, you know, I'll take your advice, but give me a couple of days. I've got to get, you know, I've got my new baby and my girlfriend. And yeah, she makes mother sound a dirty word, that one doesn't she use quoting of quote from the newspaper from the days before. And he said, uh, yes, you, you better leave Sydney because otherwise, you know, your shadow won't be able to piss without us pinching the shadow. So I bought a couple of days and um, got the hashish thing through, we finished do it off, so I managed to leave Sydney with some money. So, and I get down to Melbourne and I meet an old friend of mine, Joel Ellenberg, the painter sculptor, lovely guy. And he's living in Gore Street, Fitzroy, with Jennifer Clare, the actress, who did her most memorable work, I think, at the um, Russell Street Theatre. She was quite marvellous. Um, he was living with her in Gore Street. And I was around here every day snorting coke or we were smoking opium and Joel would be drawing or painting and I'd be sort of madly writing or magging or doing whatever we were doing, having a lot of fun. And Jennifer Clare's with the Congress knew Sweeney quite well and, and the guy had seen Sweeney and said, oh, look, it's an old man, Joel's has just turned up. Well, Joel reckons he's, he's a pretty, pretty flash off poet. Well, Sweeney wanted to meet me, so Sweeney met me and we met and it was all very convivial and he wined me and dined me and I appreciated all of that. Good wine, good food from Delano's, it tasted divine. 
Um, and then I got to make, it was important that I was to make Barrett. And that's when the friendship with Barrett and Sweeney started in that same linkage of time. And um, uh, that was how I sort of got to Heidi. It was, you know, had been thrown out of Sydney for LSD. Wound up in Melbourne and uh, met Sweeney and then Barrett and then out to Heidi and John and various politicians and other kinds of mongrels. <laughs> Used to hang around the joint. But a lot of painters had come through and, and interesting people like Barry Jones from the early years I remember him coming. Um, we had a amalgam of people but it was it, it was exactly how I was pictured living in a relatively elegant manner without having to bust the balls in business, you know, you could do it reasonably. You know, you'd only need a couple of hundred, oh, sorry, a couple of mil or something to be able to have a lifestyle of this quality and be surrounded by this quality of people and stuff like that. You could do it quite easily. So it, it was almost, hiding was a, something of a template for me in, the, in my future dealings with uh, painters and, and also the ways in which I set my own houses up, you know, when I was in Poonwong, it was open party. Seven days a week. <laughs> uh, now we're in the middle of the city, of course, it's a lot quieter. <laughs> I think Shelton's influence, um, I think of Shelley as the, uh, the sort of Lou Reed of Melbourne poetry, and um, many, many poets have come to Shelton over all the years and sat around the corner at his desk and relaxed and had a smoke and talked about poetry and I think he has had a profound influence on the scene here. For Barrett Reed, a scholar and a gentleman and there's not many of us left. It is you that is the dangerous one, hugging the curves of your love of art with the speed of your need for new libraries, places where the heart could rule with the brain. It is you who rides the wild poet's curves, ministering at the crash sites of the absurd, suffering the loneliness of the written word. It is you that is strong for those who lag, and who found the dangerous crim with a poet's soul, the him a way of changing the gears on life's grim roads. You are always aware of the new, you are ready to break through the roadblocks that art often erects against its own kind. And the poet should never go to the police to solve problems. A line that you drew and I have never crossed. You are the outlaw, besuited and slick and as handsome as hell. You got away with more than most. Rubbed shoulders with premiers and vitas the drunk Cossack poet to escape from a bleak Russian jail. You smelled paint and dreamed dreams with Nolan and Hope, Percival, Boyd, Ellenberg, Sunday and John. The list just goes on. And you were the outlaw that bailed me out of the cells and taught me that poetry is not just about metre and rhyme, but what goes on between the lines. You were the elegant street bum, like me, an apostle of the free, breathless and beguiled, Standing at the literal of your smile, you pierce seaward from your edge. Yeah. Barrett's really important in Shelton's life. Oh, it's incredibly important, yeah. Well, they met in the, uh, probably around 1970, I think. Shelton tells the story, they met in Fanny's. Um, with, and he had Wendy and um, Chaos, everything. And Barrett was enormously important because they did have uh, a brief affair and um, Shelton was quite upfront with me about that. Um, but for him, 
uh, I think Barrett soon realised that for, for Shelton, Shelton was primarily heterosexual, so the sexual component ended fairly quickly, but the friendship continued for a very, very long, well, 30 odd years. And um, I think, I mean, Barrett, Barrett loved Shelton, there's no doubt about it, you know, po I mean, the poems or things, things that he did for him, the way he helped him and so on. And he gave him a key to Heidi, and that made Shelton feel really secure in the friendship. Because Barrett said to Shelton, you know, my door will always be open to you. And for someone like Shelton with such a vagabond kind of background, to have somewhere where he could just fall in and knew that he'd be accepted was incredibly important. And he always used to say that, how important that was to him, you know. That was an enormously important French, aside from what Barrett taught him. And I'm not talking about just poems, poetry and art and that kind of thing. I think that's where a lot of Shelton's mentoring came from in later life, you know. But Barrett was an incredible mentor. I mean, he would always have young artists or... I mean, that was a hiding tradition. You mentored, mentored artists, whether they were musicians or sculptors or whoever they were. And I think Shelton saw Barrett do this over the years as well as in the very early years, saw um, John and Sunday. And it just came naturally to him to do that later on, particularly here in the bookshop here, when he finally had a place and a space that he could bring people to, you know. After he died, we were jolly well, we had script, we had um, manuscripts all over the place, you know, had to get them back to this person and back to that person. People would send him manuscripts, they'd come and talk to him. So it just it became a natural thing for him to do that, and I'm sure it was just part of that Heidi tradition that he that he'd learned. Shelton was kind of my poetry godfather, and I must say, Shelley and Eric Beach, they were the first poets that I read and admired, and then I went to see them at a live poetry venue, and um, yeah, that was an eye opener. They were both quite drunk. <laughs> They sat there and they listened to everything and they were actually really encouraging to me. I read my first poems like this. Oh, I never was at a Ravensbrook. I've got the marks to prove it. And they said to me, stand up and be proud. I never was at a Ravensbrook. I've got the marks to prove it. They showed me how to read. And they showed me that there were people in this world who were just poets. That's what they were, they were poets. They lived poetry, they saw poetry, they breathed it, they loved it. They were servants of the muse. And Shelton, to me, is the person who was really a pure poetry soul. Poetry sang in his heart all the time, to the exclusion of many other things, really. It was what it was all about. And Shelley, of course, gave a voice to people who didn't have a voice, you know? People who couldn't speak for themselves. Shelton saw them, wrote them down, gave them a voice. Otherwise, it would have been just empty cans rolling down the street. Um, as to what other people think, I don't know. I think he hoped his poems would be remembered. Um, particularly those poems would be remembered, I think, aside from the other poetry that a lot of people talk about and being a romantic poet, you know, and he did. A lot of his poems could be fairly um, wordy sometimes. I mean, he loved certain images, you know. He loved um, butterflies. <laughs> butterflies would often appear in his poetry. He loved nature and uh, then he got a thing about fish at one stage. So there were the domestic the domestic and rather metaphysical poems about our pond at the back here and the fish and what the fish did in it and <laughs> how fish saw time and so he was playful in that respect and I often think people who are artists whether they're painters or poets or sculptors and they go through phases in their life um, at the beginning they're learning their craft then they hit those middle years and often then they're very intent with saying something purposeful you know, 
and the sculptors or the painters, they're really making a statement, or even poets might be, you could look, be looking at Shelton's, um, perhaps his um, Aboriginal poems there. And then, as they get into later life, they start to play. Right? They start to play. And I love it. Um, I wish Shelton had lived longer, so you could have seen him starting to play in his poetry a lot more, you know? Those splendid ripples that occur on otherwise unruffled ponds where rain is not about and there is an abundance of air there you will find echoes of fish farts the goldfish burp a litany their sleek long flesh slides through ripples making as they pass a song it is like I'm underwater the roses are anemones softly blushing under air well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to stay doing what I'm doing for the moment because I'm in a great amount of poems, meaning a great amount of pain. Um, <coughs> so if you will bear that twice, I'm sure I can see your, your head a little later. Um, this is just Nebuchadnezzar. For the painting by Arthur Boyd, for Sonny Booth and Lionel Rhodes, and in the voice of Sonny Booth. But I am Nebuchadnezzar. My balls are caught tight with white wire. I am caught in extremis failing, paying the price for the poor. My body prays with fire. But I am Nebuchadnezzar, the startled king of Fitzroy. The cloud stud and the subtle landscapes of trees emanate from me. But I am the king of what's loud. But I am the Nebuchadnezzar, I am the king of Fitzroy. My skin is black, my heart is strong. Yeah. Thanks, love. My heart is strong. Whose balls are... Oh, I'm back up there. <laughs> you see my gardens there in Gertrude Street, beneath the high-rise flats? That's my Babylon that long I've fought for and on behalf of all of my tribe. For well, this is my long brother's country, and I am its king, whose balls are caught tight with white wire. Okay. I was walking down the street just the other day, so he was a snowdrop kid, and we decided to drop into Wayne Jay's to see Chloe. And I, she was going to get sold sometime soon by Bondi. Anyway, we barely poked our noses through the door when the manager's fronted up his arms akimbo as if recently crucified and he says, Use to out. Get out. Yous have already been barred for forever before. So I gives the snowdrop kid a nudge and a wink in the ribs and shoves his bloke aside. I'll call the cops, he says. Go right or on, we said and chuffed on through to the bar. Well, we barely had a chance to glance at the azure eyes of Chloe when the jacks all dressed in blue and in front of them the manager pointing at us and rather disgusted we've had to hit the tail go out the other way real fast and we've jumped on this bus. And on this bus was this grand dame all dressed in white, linen I think it was and she looked superb in her peach mulber hat so I gives the snowdrop kid another nudge and a wink and a ribs and proceeds down the aisle and props opposite her and lets her know just how wonderful she looks that her eyes are lapis lazuli that her lips are as lewd as the sea that her face is a map of a difficult country that only a true search of her dreams could explore. And this idiot bus driver has turned around to me and said, you can't talk to an old woman like that. I was rather bewildered and startled. I began to explain that I had taken great pains to be polite to this grand demoiselle. When down the aisle came the conductress, her eyes... Obsidian, as dangerous as daggers, 
saying much the same thing as the conductor. And behind her came this pimple-faced youth, old enough to be my current bun, my son, you understand, saying, I'm a police cadet. So fucking what I turns me head to him and says, look, if the toe sun before somebody here really gets hurt, what's the matter with you, Mom, anyway, if a man can't compliment a woman without copping all this crap? So between the bus stops, the bus stopped. The snowdrop kid and I got off to avoid any blues. And rather aloof and with a sadness and tiredness, we docked, had imagining cats to the fast disappearing. Pete smelled a hat. That's lesson number one for a poet. Simply don't walk out the door without at least one poem. You kick or one in the fore break. So it's always there, ready. Okay? <laughs>